Hi, this is Rachel, and today we're going to cover topic 18, assessments in our supervision curriculum. So when we talk about assessments, there are a few different types of assessments. One type of assessment is norm referenced. Another is criterion referenced. And then within um, behavior analysis, we have a functional behavior assessment, which we'll actually have another topic um, on completely. So the primary focus today is on norm referenced and criterion referenced assessments. So norm reference assessments are going to compare an individual to another group and how much that individual fits within that group or how much they differ from that group. Oftentimes, norm referenced assessments are going to be um, used to identify uh, where someone might be struggling, some identified needs where they differ from their peers. Um, these might be uh, things like the Vineland is a norm referenced assessment, and it might give like age comparisons uh, that, that this learner's performance is similar to a peer without a diagnosis um, at such and such an age. Um, the Goals behind norm referenced assessments are often so that the individual can be identified to receive extra services, to get a diagnosis, um, to uh, identify areas of deficit compared to their peers. In contrast, criterion referenced assessments are comparing the learner to themselves and their progress over time. So criterion reference assessments would be once you've identified, maybe here are some areas that need to be targeted um, compared to where their peers might be or compared to where this other group is, then progress is shown on the criterion reference assessments because they compare the same individual to themselves over time. So we can see what progress has been made. Um, both have their place. And as behavior analysts, we should be using both. Uh, for norm reference assessments, I mentioned the Vineland. That is one that I have used. Um, some insurance funders have requested Vineland scores um, when you do reauthorizations. Um, so identifying a norm reference assessment that you can conduct with learners um, when they enter services and then periodically maybe at authorizations or annually or at minimum when they leave your service to show progress um, compared to uh, another population. Another um, assessment that is norm referenced is the PDDBI. Now the norm or the group that your individual is compared to in that case is classic autism. Now, I don't know how they defined that. You can read their book and, um, and, and understand that system better. But when you score it, if your learner falls sort of in that middle area, then um, they are uh, fit within the group of this is what we expect from someone with a diagnosis of autism. If they have scores above or below that middle area, then that's where you look at, are there other um, diagnoses that we need to look at? Are there areas where this does not fit and maybe autism is not the correct diagnosis for this learner or something, right? So it's outside of that norm. Criterion referenced assessments, like I said, are used to measure progress. So in behavior analysis, some of the common criterion reference assessments are um, the ABLES, um, PEAK, um, the VB map, 
is um, with a little bit of like a, a norm comparison because it does have level one would be typical for this age group level two this age group level three this age group so there is a little bit of a a norm comparison in there um, but primarily it's used to monitor that progress so the same individual is retested and we see okay they have developed more skills in this area but that doesn't necessarily tell us where their peers are in that area or how they compare to their peers in the area just that they have made progress um, if you work in a school-based setting um, this would be your progress towards your iep goals how are you measuring progress um, for the individual versus the norm reference assessments are how did they qualify for services? So every three years, there's a three year re-eval. Those evaluations are probably a lot more of the norm referenced assessments uh, in a school system because those are going to determine eligibility. Does this individual still need specialized services? versus um, in IEPs and setting your goals each year and monitoring the progress towards IEPs, that's going to be more like your criterion reference assessment, where you are seeing their progress as you continue to teach. Um, but we're just looking at their progress, not how their progress compares to another individual. Now, like I said, we are going to devote a whole topic to a functional assessment, but briefly the functional behavior assessment in behavior analysis is designed to determine the function of a specific behavior in order to then identify uh, replacement behaviors to help meet the needs of that learner um, in a more uh, efficient and effective way. We'll cover that in a future topic. Um, all right, so we want to conduct assessments in a way that is going to give us the most information about uh, the learner for the purposes of what we are trying to do. Most often, we are trying to identify areas of need and maybe identify strategies that are going to work best for this learner to then learn new skills. So the assessment is your probe data. It's your baseline or your return to baseline um, after intervention. And you're going to conduct these oftentimes with an individual who is not normally directly working with the learner. So for example, in a traditional um, clinic type setting or, or a tiered uh, service delivery model, the consultant might come in and conduct the assessment, write the plans, and the technicians are the ones that are implementing it. Then when it's time to do the other assessment, the consultant comes back in and conducts the assessment. So it's not that this person is unfamiliar with the learner, but that they are not the one working directly with the learner on a regular basis. One reason that we do that is because it allows us to measure that generalization across people. This isn't the person who's teaching me regularly, but yet can I still display this skill? You may find some learners struggle with that piece. They can do it great with individuals who they already have rapport, who already have um, stimulus control or instructional control, um, but they're unable to do it with a new person. Um, and that just identifies then another area where we want to help support that learner in helping them to generalize across people. Um, also, we want to uh, use materials that are not necessarily the teaching materials. So again, we're looking for that generalization. Um, we want to have what what I always did was we'd have a kit. This is the assessment kit and it's used just for assessments. The only time the learners see it is for assessment. And then when we're teaching, we use different materials. And this is to sort of uh, do a couple of things again to uh, 
uh, to assess that generalization from the teaching materials to novel materials that are still measuring the same concept. Um, and it also uh, helps to avoid that like teaching to the test, right? We don't want to teach the learner just specifically how to score better on the ABLES because that's not the measure, like the ABLES is a measure of how their skill set, you know, what skills they have. We don't want to teach just to pass an assessment when the learner doesn't have those skills incorporated into their natural environment, into their repertoire. So by using different materials, we can also help, you know, create that difference. We're not teaching exactly to the test. The test, the ass assessment is supposed to measure skills that the learner has, not like we're trying to pass the assessment. So um, during assessments, we also are trying to return to baseline. So we're trying to identify what the learner can do without supports, or if we are using prompting or supports, we are clearly specifying what those are. Um, ideally, prompts and supports would be around maybe attending to the activity or remaining in proximity to the assessor um, to the activity um, or, or trying to increase just engagement with the activity um, so that we can then assess, um, look, when they are attending and engaged, um, then here's what they're able to do versus um, helping them through to answer. That might be how we teach, but that's not what we're trying to measure on assessment. We're trying to see do they remember any of that teaching? Can they generalize those skills to this new setting? Now, a lot of assessments have observation components and that's really good because then we're just observing how the learner is interacting with certain materials or in certain situations. Um, but some assessments do have items where you do present it in, um, in a more discreet fashion. So, hey, if I have all of these cards out, can you find this one? Which one is that one? Where's the this? Um, I want to be sure that if I'm testing those things that I'm not prompting, that I'm not accidentally prompting, that I'm not providing support, at least initially, to find out what they know. Now, for some individuals, it might be helpful to help them through it once you have once you finish like you you find out okay without any supports here's what they're able to do i write that down now i can introduce a, a little bit of support and i can make notes about that because that can then give me information about what strategies or supports or prompts might be effective in continuing to progress on this goal um, however we want to try to not provide uh, a lot of prompting in the assessment because the assessment again is to identify uh, what supports they need what areas they still have support needs um does that make sense <laughs> all right so uh reinforcement um oftentimes when we are teaching we are delivering a high rate of reinforcers because we are um, trying to reinforce the specific skill or response that we are practicing um, during an assessment our reinforcement should be the same across the board whether an individual is um, getting things correct or incorrect it should be geared towards participation not um correctness of a skill so either um only making comments and not using any praise statements um so i i worked with um uh, with a, a consultant who taught their technicians uh, or would during their assessments also um, just make comments. Your shirt is green. Uh, do this. I'm wearing blue. Da -da -da -da. And they would just comment on things. Um, I tried it. It felt really 
unnatural and challenging for me. So what I tend to do instead is just praise everything. Thank you so much. Oh, great try. You did wonderful. And so again, I'm not swaying the correct or incorrect. I'm praising participating. I'm praising engagement. Um, and I'm not focused on praising correct or incorrect. No matter what they do, I'm going to provide some sort of praise statement or thank you statement. Um, sometimes uh, we do want to make sure that we are not um, triggering certain uh, behaviors by using certain phrases that may come across as a demand that then we have to follow through with, or um, using particular words um, if we know that those are upsetting for the individual. So often um, during assessments, we phrase things as a question. Can you show me that? Which one do you think this is? Uh, do you know what this is? And make it all very optional. Because again, you're looking to see what the learner can do, what they already know, what's generalized um, from teaching settings, and where they might need additional supports. So if you phrase it as a question and they opt not to answer, then that's okay. That just means that you've identified that um, the motivation for answering the questions is not there. And that would be something that we might want to support for that learner. Um, but instead of presenting it as a demand, touch blue, touch red, where, you know, touch green, you could say, ooh, can you find red? Can you find green? Can you find blue? Um, it makes it so that it's not a statement or a demand that then the learner is expected to follow through, it makes it so that it's an option. And if they want to and can show you, they can. And if they don't want to, that gives you information about motivation for this activity. So trying to phrase things into a, um, a, an optional format is great. Also, not to stick with one task because they haven't shown you, right? I kind of do the like three tries and we move on, um, but not necessarily three back-to-back -back tries. It, it sort of depends upon the situation. Um, it might be three back-to-back -back tries if I thought maybe my learner was, was close, maybe they didn't quite scan the whole way, um, or I might spread it out to just see if I can capture a little bit of motivation under a different context. So things to remember when conducting assessments, you're often um, doing the assessment with a person that is different than the teaching that allows us to assess generalization. Um, we don't want to be providing a lot of prompts. If we're prompting, it should just be for like engagement with the activity. Um, reinforcement, we don't want to differentially reinforce correct or incorrect responding. Instead, we want to keep our praise and reinforcement level the same. So um, just reinforcing participation is a good way to do that. Um, and we want to phrase things as like questions or optional and stick with them maybe two, three times before moving on and just marking that they didn't display it during this assessment. So for the assignment, uh, read introduction and explanation material um, for various assessment books. Now, I would look at which assessments are um, that you have access to, first of all, um, and then assessments that might be um, recommended for your population or assessments that funders, um, if you're working with insurance funding, um, would be likely to request. So look at them, uh, un try to understand and uh, where each of those come from and what they are um, trying to do. So are they norm referenced or criterion referenced? Um, what's the population that they're looking for? Um, what about uh, 
what about the um, assessment? Are they covering all areas or is it focused to maybe just social skills? Um, there are some examples there. There are a lot more than that. Abel's, VBMAP, Vineland, uh, AFL's, Peak, um, essential, uh, essential skills for essential living skills. I think that's the one. Essential living skills is another one. Socially savvy is another one. There are lots of assessment materials. Um, you might be able to go to a library or a resource library or um, special ed uh, resources or something like that to kind of like look through. Some of them might have their information on the website, but the best, um, more detailed information is going to be in those protocol books. All right, so then you're going to describe the difference between norm referenced and criterion referenced assessments. Um, you're going to describe the prompting and reinforcement techniques that you would use during an assessment. Um, number four, identify the assessment that you would use with the following client. So if you had a client who was uh, four years old, had an autism spectrum diagnosis, limited vocal communication skills, they're enrolled in preschool and their parents and caregivers are concerned with self-help skills. What assessment or assessments would you use to help identify the strengths and weaknesses for that individual to help you then set um, goals? Um, then, uh, number five, view the VB map assessment video on YouTube. It's here on this channel. Um, and there's three parts, um, and it covers a, uh, a VB map assessment with a, uh, two and a half year old. Um, and then you want to practice, I say practice VB map, because I think that that one is a nice, easy, um, structured one to get started with. If you've never done any assessments before, I think it's spelled out and, and chunked nicely. Um, however, if you have, or if the VB map is not an assessment that you would ever be using with your population, um, schedule a practice assessment with your supervisor. Um, this is important that you don't just read about assessments, you practice the assessments, you get someone to practice with you, um, and you get feedback on how that goes so that you can see what this is going to look like. And in our next topic, we're actually going to talk about program development and identifying and writing goals based upon the assessment. So it's great to have a practice assessment under your belt. All right, so as always, if you have questions or comments or feedback, um, please list it in the comments below. Subscribe if you want to continue to uh, get notifications about this uh, topic series as we continue through our field supervision topics. And hopefully we'll see you next time. Bye.